Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. You know, there's something to be said for having a keen sense of understanding your material. And if you're within the sound of my voice, that must mean you are in the seats with once more. As always, my name is Dave Voigt, and I'm the host of this podcast where we sit down with a wide-ranging variety of industry professionals, and we pick their brain about current projects, state of the industry, how they got started, and so very much more in a light and in a conversational fashion. And if you like how we do things around here, I'm going to go out on a limb and assume that you do because you're listening right now. Uh, you can subscribe to the podcast. You can find us uh, wherever you get your podcasts. We're at Apple, Amazon, Spotify, Google. It's all good. And plus, we archive every single one of our episodes over at our In the Seats YouTube channel. So if you can give us a like and subscribe there as well, we absolutely appreciate it. Also, don't hesitate to check us out on social media. We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, and we're on Instagram at, you guessed it, In the Seats, for all sorts of fun updates. And finally, and I do dare say most importantly, please pay us a visit over at In the Seats, intheseats.ca, for all the latest and greatest from the world of film, television, basically the moving image at large. Because if we love to write about it and talk about it, we love it when you come by and read about it and listen about it. So please pay us a visit. On this episode, we got a good one. It's coming to theaters this Friday, July 1st. Canada Day. It has nothing to do with Canada Day, but it's uh, felt like noting that since I am Canadian. But the film is called Mr. Malcolm's List. It is an absolute delight. Uh, it's uh, The best way to b- describe it would be, uh, it's almost like uh, someone did some Jane Austen fan fiction. But it's it's a lot of, a lot of fun. And... Uh, it's the story of a, of a young woman who, uh, when she fails to meet an item on the list of requirements for a bride, uh, she's jilted by, you know, London's most eligible bachelor, this Mr. Malcolm. And feeling humiliated and determined to exact revenge, she convinces her friend to play the role of his ideal match to, to bring him down. But things don't go as planned, because Mr. Malcolm soon wonders if he's found the perfect woman or if or if he stumbled into the perfect hoax it's uh it's a rarity because honestly these sort of period piece type romances tend to take themselves a little too seriously sometimes but this film really has a keen sense of uh comedy and sort of having a nice little wink at the at the camera and not taking itself too seriously while still respecting sort of the romantic angle of it all. It's, I was pleasantly surprised by it and I got managed to get roped into it. It's from uh, director Emma Holly Jones, who he had the unique pleasure of uh, sitting down and talking with. It's uh, stars Frida Pinto and a bunch of other people. It is, it is an absolutely delightful film. And I mean, we asked about the origins of the story because it was a book and then it was a screenplay on the blacklist and then so on and so forth. It was a short, but this is such a fun movie that I just, I cannot recommend it enough. It is, uh, it's definitely, it slants towards, uh, the, the ladies who want to see a good romance on screen, but, uh, gentlemen, I'm here to tell you it's actually pretty funny too. So you will, you will be able to get into it if your dates are, are dragging me out to see it. It's it is a fun fun ride. Like I said, starring Frida Pinto, uh, starring Theo James, starring a um, Oliver Jackson Cohen, uh, a Zowie Ashton, a bunch of people. It's a lot a lot of fun. It is in theaters this Friday, July first, from our friends at Level Film. But uh, first, before you go buy tickets, which I think they're on sale now at Cineplex or your favorite uh, you know exhibitor. But first, before you do that, check out our talk with Emma Holly Jones to find out more about Mr. Malcolm's List. We talked about it a lot, and it's uh, you know, between you and me, it's a good conversation. I think I like this one. All right, bye. All right, well, Emma, obviously, first off, just thank you so much for the time today. I really appreciate this. No problem. Are you well? I am well. Are you well? I'm good. Yeah, I'm great. <laughs> No, I mean, obviously, congratulations on the movie. I mean, I absolutely, I absolutely loved it. But I mean, this, this has evolved from many forms. It was a self-published book. It was a short. Can you walk me sort of through the origin of how we got to this point? Yeah, it's been, it's been about seven years since, um, well, I actually, it's a funny story because I actually heard the script for the first time. Um, There is a 
screenwriting service in Hollywood called The Blacklist. Right. Um, that happens to be run by my now husband. Um, and uh, about seven years ago, they had a uh, a podcast where they would get actors together and do uh, table reads of some of the scripts. So I was actually driving my car when I heard Malcolm's List for the first time. And I, so it's a very weird way to come across a piece of material, obviously, you know, listening to it rather than um, reading it. But it, it provided, I guess, the, you know, my imagination to sort of run wild with it, hearing in that way. And um, there was this wonderful actress involved uh, in that reading called Ashley Medecre, who is a dear friend, and she is a Black British girl. And hearing her sort of read the role of Julia really started to get my brain ticking about how it might be interesting to make a sort of piece of Jane Austen fan fiction today for an audience in, you know, 2022 now. Um, and uh, I kind of fell in love with it. So, you know, uh, after that, it was talking to the agents of the writer, meeting the writer, Suzanne, and... Um, you know, optioning the material. Um, I then obviously as a first time feature director, obviously I was directing commercial work and documentary work before, um, I very much knew that I was going to have to make, um, you know, some sort of proof of concept. Yeah. And I, because I think one first time feature director in general is a risky um, financial move for any for sure, yeah. But two, period drama, you know, uh, is a whole other ball game. So uh, I, I live in Los Angeles, but I very much realized that you cannot make a short proof of concept for something that is period in British in Griffith Park with a couple of horses and not much money. <laughs> so, I, I mean, I was very lucky that the two producers that I was working with, Laura Lewis and Laura Rister, had a very good relationship with um, a woman called Shannon Gibson, who's actually an EP on the film. Um, who was working with Refinery29 at the time. And they had this short film series called Shatterbox, which was basically a female short film fund. So we approached them to, you know, uh, sort of partner on this. And they basically became the development financers for the piece. Um, so they gave us a pretty decent budget to make that short film in England with all its bells and whistles, you know. And that short film was then, you know, we decided very quickly I didn't want to do film festivals. I really wanted people to see it. Um, I wanted to prove that there was an audience for this. So I chose to put it on YouTube with Refinery29. And I think that was a big part of how we got the bigger version financed. That's awesome. I love that. Mm -hmm. Now, I so, mean, yeah. I've, yeah. I mean, I've Pretty got to say, well, yeah. no, but, I, but I mean, whatever works in this day and age for sure. But I mean, I think something that I appreciated about this, and I mean, I say this not just as a film fan, but I mean, as a guy, mm. sometimes the sort of quote unquote Jane Austen type stuff tends to take itself almost a little too seriously. Yeah. This had a very clear cut sense of humor while it was still respecting sort of the romantic angle all at the same time. I'm kind of curious, how, how did you manage to sort of walk the line in telling this kind of story? Well, I think I like to think I'm pretty funny. Um, I mean, like some people might agree, some people won't. But I think I, I said to Suzanne when I met her, uh, you know, I, there's two things I want to make. I want to make something that's romantic and I want to make something that's funny. What I was really trying to do um, in, in my head was create, you know, uh, an ode to some of those amazing British 90s rom-coms right. in 1818. So I was trying to sort of blend that sort of Richard Curtis, Nora Ephron-esque style of movie with uh, a Regency, very fun fantasy world. For sure. And um, that, you know, those filmmakers are very much people I've, you know, these are movies I still watch today and I find very funny. So, um, you know, uh, Suzanne was incredible and really let me come in and polish the script and do a bit of a comedy punch up and, you know, even another amazing uh, story actually from the short film was um, Divian Ladwa, who plays John the Footman. He was uh, just a background artist on the short film. And he came up to me one day on set and he goes, I know how I'm going to get myself into this scene. And I remember thinking, that's kind of bold, but sure, okay, like, <laughs> tell me, what are you going to do? And he told me, and I could not stop laughing. 
And, you know, John and Molly, the footman and the maid, they're not in the book. They were not in the original script. They were created by those two actors on the set of the short film and we let them improv. And we did that through the entire feature as well, because I realized also within casting this movie, I was very lucky. I've cast some brilliant comedians, you know, Divian's ability to observe a scene and make an eye roll, the funniest thing you've ever seen is uh, like nothing I've ever quite experienced before. I mean, I, I, I was watching him sort of react and do bits on the feature film set and uh, the crew were like putting scarves in their mouths and like <laughs> stuffing their masks in their mouth because he's just so funny. And I, and I never, you know, it's all a testament to him. It was all him. I just let him figure out how, you know, he was a character basically that was approached through improv through the entire process. And the same with Shanat, who plays Molly. And then obviously Oliver Jackson Cohen and Zowie Ashton are, I think people knew Zowie was funny because of some of her previous work, but the girl has a gift with comedic timing and she was taking lines and making them funny in a way I didn't even realize was funny on the, on the paper. And Ollie Jackson Cohen was just a real knockout surprise about how unbelievably good with comedy he is as well. And I think, you know, once you've got that sort of level of talent doing, working, I guess, with a team that are looking to laugh and looking to create joy. And as you said, not create something that's too serious. Um, it became very, very easy and they all made me look very, very good. Um, but I think it's one of the things I very much set out to do was make something that was funny and not just romance I think you know I've been greatly inspired by so much British comedy over the years but as you know Suzanne would say it's you know Oscar Wilde meets Jane Austen <laughs> and, <I> say, <laughs> and then uh and then I'm like and add a little bit of Richard Curtis in so yeah well, I mean, that's brilliant. And I mean, it almost feels like it had to happen this way because, I mean, obviously, you know, when someone's doing their first feature, they don't necessarily put period drama or period piece beside it as, as sort of a recommended genre. But mm -hmm. I mean, there's the carry through with Suzanne and obviously some of the casting carries over from the short to the feature. How important was it to you to sort of have this almost sort of built in family as the project evolved? Um, I honestly, I couldn't, to be honest, I didn't really think about it. I just think I was just fiercely loyal to the people that had said yes and, um, remained fiercely loyal to them. And also, you know, I remember when Frida and Chauffe walked onto set the first day on the short film and as the characters and they don't interact in the short film. They just look at each other across, a, you know, across the way and they'd never met. And I watched them look at each other and went, yeah, we're good. Do you know what I mean? Like uh, so much of this film hinges on those two's chemistry. And even on the short film with just one look, I knew it existed. And also just watching those um, actors walk onto set in those costumes and those characters, it was very, very hard to shake that vision in my head for, you know, the years that came afterwards. You know, when I, when I was polishing the script or developing the script or casting of the parts, it was always those those people in you know in my head so uh, I never even questioned it really I think that's what it comes down to I mean uh Gemma Chan is uh incredible in the short and she's a really good friend of mine she could she was never going to be able to do the feature because of her schedule and she mm -hmm. was doing the Eternals and um so when uh Zowie came in um you know that was the one character that really changed from the short to the feature because Zowie is a completely different style of actress and I think Zowie uh, talking about the comedy I think Zowie really took Malcolm's from you know um a romantic drama to a to a romantic comedy mm. um so she was the the character that massively went through a lot of development and work um you know from the short film but I think you know it was it set a different bar for the rest of the cast and the rest of the film to allow themselves to sort of step into those sorts of comedic ensemble shoes, you know? So, yeah, I didn't question it much at all. Well, I mean, it's, it goes back to the old joke that, you know, 90% of the job is casting because, I mean, you obviously can't sort of fake that kind of chemistry. You can't necessarily force it. And, I mean, 
you feel the joy of them having fun as you watch the movie, which I think is one of its big selling points. And I mean, I'm just, just to start putting a bow on this, I mean, this is something I always like to ask. I'm always curious about the movies sort of at a younger age that you saw that got you into this business in the first place. Is there anything that comes to mind? Yeah. So I, if you, if you, if you ask my family or if you ask anyone who knows me, um, whenever I'm down, I'll watch a period drama like I've watched <laughs> Downton Abbey twice I just find it very comforting I, I don't know what it is about period films but ever since a young age I think like the sound of music jumps out of me it's something I've watched time and time and time again um but I I love um you know and and then there's obviously some of the greats like Pride and Prejudice Joe Wright's version Ang Lee Sense and Sensibility like even uh, Barry Lyndon Stanley Kubrick which I just think on a technical level are just some of the most stunning films and you know I I I'm named after Jane Austen's Emma I don't know it was kind of like in, <laughs> it, it, it was kind of in my blood and um I studied English literature in England so I, I, I guess all of these things were um you know things I knew at the moment I said I want to become a director I was like I've always known I wanted to do a period piece to, to answer your question further like for my first film I never thought that was possible mm. so that's the bit that I'm like I can't believe we quite, I quite actually did that but you know I mean it was um it's been a love of mine for as long as I can remember and uh I I watched nearly re-watched nearly all of them in prep for the movie um much to the annoyance of my husband I'm sure but um yeah I'm a big 90s rom-com period drama fan so I really made my own fan fiction as well, in a way. No, and I mean, you did, but you did it with a real wry sensibility and just sort of, I mean, almost a wink and a nod to the past at the same time while sort of crafting your own kind of space. And it's like, honestly, I mean, just as a film fan in general who wouldn't necessarily was a huge, like, can appreciate some of the stuff that you love, but wasn't a huge fan of it. I really mm. enjoyed this. And I mean, I can't wait for more people to see it and just... Thank you thank so much you. for the time. And I mean, congrats on the work, really. Thank you. As I've been saying to people, I just wanted to make something that felt like a, a good cup of tea. You know what? So, and that's exactly what this is. Congratulations on that. And again, thank you so much for the time. No, thank you so much. Have a lovely day. And don't forget to, to visit our friends over at Bay Street Video for all your DVD, Blu-ray rental or purchasing needs this summer as they are still open for curbside and some mailing delivery as well. Over at 1172 Bay Street, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, you can give them a call at 416-964-9088. That's 416-964-9088. Or send them an email at baystreetvideoto at gmail.com for any of your DVD and Blu-ray needs. <laughs>